Well, thank you all for coming today. Today's demo is going to be about router tables and all the stuff that we use them for and all the things we can buy for them to make them more productive. Basically, we're talking about two types of router tables. We're talking about bench top and we're talking about freestanding. Anything is a combination of the two. Sometimes you'll have uh, table saws that are modified so that at the end of the table saw, you've also got a router table. It'll be the same thing. It's gonna be a freestanding or this. What are the advantages and disadvantages? I like this because it's at the perfect height for me to move things around the table. This one is always gonna be on top of something. And most benches, are at a height that we could work comfortably and this is not that height so to use one of these we're going to have to have a bench that's lower so to get this level here we need a bench about this tall that's the only really disadvantage of the bench tops is a lot of times they're just a little bit too high to be comfortable things i want you to note on all these tables the first thing is for safety's sake you really need one of these this is an on and off switch. So you're we're gonna plug your router into this switch and plug this switch into the socket. That way, you're not on here like this looking for switches with your hand up here. Everything's right there in front of you. And these things are great. These are made, of course these are optioned, but um, this one will fit right here. So you can get them all the way around. Fence. The next thing we want to get into, the fence needs to be able to take accessories that are going to hold what we're routing in place. And at full speed, this is turning 22,000. If you took a piece of wood and introduced it to this here, these blades are traveling approximately 30 miles an hour. So imagine taking anything and putting it past of something going 30 miles an hour. So you want good positive control. You see a lot of people use their fingers and stuff, but that's not the safest thing to do because a router accident is very hard to recover from because you don't get clean slices, you just get goo. So we want a fence that's one, going to help us keep our fingers and toes away from this and it's going to do its job as far as holding the wood and, and uh, presenting it. One thing about fences. The router bit is a round bit. It turns in a circle. It doesn't matter if the fence is this way or this way or this way. As far as the cutter is concerned, it's always going to be 90 degrees. Okay. Where we need to be aware of that is how we're going to hold the wood to cut. Everybody knows what these are. These are just fingerboards. This is the easiest way to hold a piece of wood in place to go through the router. These are protectors that are supposed to be here to help us not put our hands unconsciously in here. Um, use them as you see fit. Get, slide this out of the way, sir. This has got holes drilled into it to keep this in place. This doesn't. So your fence may present these in different ways. I do not like this at all. I like this. I like to be able to move stuff around on the fence. So when you look to buy one of these, one of the things you're looking for is how adaptable is your fence to things. This is good. This is a nice one right here, I can actually, you're looking for a fence that's got knobs in the back, so you can adjust these. These are to get the edge of these as close to the edge of the router bit as you can. So you don't have big gaps. It's gonna help dust collection, and it's also gonna help safety. And when you get in the right place, just lock it in. You want tracks that you can attach accessories to. Where do these go on a router table? Well, the whole purpose of these and anything on the router table is to hold the wood in place while it's being cut. So these are actually going to go just like this. So 
So what you need to do is before you put your bit in here, take the wood that you're going to be using and just adjust these so these are pressing the wood down and into the fence. Okay. These are the ones I use in my shop. These are by Jessam. These do both of those things with one set of guides. Okay. We've got these wheels right here that are going to hold the wood down, but the wheels are not straight they're cannon so just by pushing this these wheels are pushing the piece of wood hard into the side you lot you you adjust them so you are on both sides of this push the wood through and it goes great this is what you should see this is really important if you've got a long piece of wood to wrap so we're going to wrap this long piece of wood we're just going to pretend it's a little bit on the side just around over the edge. So I'm out here in space. Again, it doesn't matter if this is straight 90 degrees to this. All that matters is that this is going to be a 90 degree whichever way the fence is facing. So first thing I do as I adjust this, so as I push this through, those wheels turn. And now I've got good solid contact, okay? I can safely be back here away while this routes. I can push it all the way through. I can push it through this way, but it's good to go. I can adjust this just by doing this. The best way to do it is if my router bit is a simple round over and I know the router bit is not coming up this high, I can bring it once they're where I want them to be. You lock the pivot piece and we press down here and lock this, press down here, lock this. And then we're ready to cut. Normally when we cut, we want to be here, but it's hard with this being this long. Your two choices are something like this. So you've got good control. You bring this through. You're engaged all the way through. You always want to hold this down. You never want to just, because as this disengages, there's a tendency for this to pop up. So it's nice to have something holding it down until it finishes. So you have got a myriad of choices with the accessories you can put on your fence, but your fence has to have this slot for you to take advantage of it, okay? That brings us to this slot, the miter slot. These are great if you're going to have some coming through here uh, that you're going to attach. And mostly what you attach here is a feather board, okay? Just something you're going to hold that piece of wood in. Because it's a feather board and feather boards adjust like this, it matter if it's actually 90 degrees. Again, before you start, you take your piece of wood, you put it on the fence, you bring your feather board up, Make sure it's got good contact, lock it in place. And we're going to show you with this one. These are the feather boards for this. This is a double stack for thick wood. And then go to town. So, another thing that you can do with a router table that you simply cannot do with a hand router is do doors. Okay, by doors I'm talking about rails and styles. It is not anywhere near safe to try to do a style which is nothing but a thin piece of wood just like this. So we've got to hold it in place and we've got to hold it 90 degrees to the cutter head. No matter which the way the fence is, it's always going to be 90 degrees to the cutter head. Okay, because it's a circle and we're just going around the circle. We've got to have something that's going to hold this in place 90 degrees. 
So a coping sled, and that's what this is called, a coping sled, is designed not to ride in any slot. It's designed to reference the fence. So there is nothing here to channel it. And by referencing the fence, we just push it forward, slide it across, and now when the cutter engages, everything is safe. Our hands are away, we've got good control here, and we just go across. This can't twist because this long piece of plastic is holding it to the fence. And we can adjust this up or down as needed. And also in this particular one, we've got stationary post. So if you're doing a three quarter inch door, you can put the three quarter inch stuff in there and it's always going to be perfect. Or it's got a slot you can slot. It gives you different choices. But this is all a coping sled is. As simple or as complex as it can be, it's going to hold a stick of wood 90 degrees to the fence, referencing off the fence with handles to keep your little hands away from it. Okay? And you cannot make doors with rails and styles without this. Because otherwise, you'd be doing this is an incredibly big no no. Okay? 22,000 RPM nice pivot point you lose control it's going to hit and then it's going to be propelled over 100 miles an hour that way if you like your fingers and toes you need to use this to cut the style the uh, this part for rails and styles and doors any questions about that okay so we already know that if we're going to make cabinets we want one of these we want one of these coping sluts what else do we want? Well, anything we could use to keep our fingers and toes away from the blade, this is a great piece. This is a, 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 miles, a micro jig. This is designed for band saws, for table saws, and also for router tables. We've got a nice handle, and you can see the handle is crooked. So when we actually press this down and push, we're pushing in. So this is gonna help keep the piece of wood right up here against this. We've got these drop down thingies here. So if I'm a piece, pushing a piece of wood, now I've got something at the end that's gonna help me push. And runs against the fence. We've got this good gripping capability. Worth its weight in gold. And remember, when any piece of wood is engaged with any cutter, whether it's a table saw, a band saw, a router, as long as the wood is engaged with the cutter, we cannot let go of the wood. It's got to be under control. It can be under control in a jig, in a coping sled, or it can be under control with us. But we have got to be have something to come through here and keep it down. Once we're clear, we're good to go. Suppose the router cuts into these. Don't care. Doesn't make any difference. If this gets used up, you throw it away and buy another one. Um, these should be replaceable too. But I have to check with Milescraft about that. But this is just a very good thing to keep your fingers and toes away from those cutter heads. We talked about the fence. We mentioned a little bit about this. We not be nice and thick. Routers are heavy. So uh, what they had years ago problems with is these tables over time would actually sag because of the weight of the router, okay? The new tables have been designed not to do that. So they take advantage of steel that we're gonna put in here to help keep it flush. Uh, some of these tables, if you reach underneath, you can cross pieces for strength. They've also made the phenolic much thicker so you just want a good solid piece. I haven't heard of any problems with stuff within the last 10 years. Uh, they've done a good job, but about 15 years ago, they had a big problem with the Phenalix when they first came out because they would sag. And once they sag, your cut's all goofed up. You're not accurate anymore. Which brings us to how we're gonna put the router in the table. Some of these things are designed for specific routers. This Bosch, is designed for that Bosch, okay? Does a great job. It's a great little router. 
If I want to raise and lower it, I turn this little thing here and this little spindle goes up and down. It's well and good for most normal router cuts. But suppose you needed a hyper accurate precise router cut exactly in a particular spot. And a good example of that is this. This is a lock miter bit. This has got to be set up exactly so you can get absolutely square joints with it. This is what I use when I make humidors. Uh, it does a great job. It's the strongest joint there is. It's, it's a perfect 90 degrees. And this translates to this. And I'll let this go around, take a look at these. But to get that, that height of that bit above the base has got to be exact, just as the depth of the fence has to be exact. What's going to give you that? Well, for that, you're going to need basically this. This is a router lift. This particular one is a Jessam Master lift. What does that mean? That means 14 different router motors will fit in this. This is adaptable by just, you put the screw in and what hole it goes into the back. Between these two things, you do not have to have to separate adapters for separate motors. 14 of them, right out of the box, will fit this right out of the box, okay? This is hyper accurate as far as machining goes. There is no drift on this. Sometimes when you're doing stuff, you've got to go back, then bring it back. This has none of that. This is exactly where you would set it. Once you've got the motor engaged, and you'll find out that this size, size plate will fit in Jessam, will fit in Woodpecker, will fit in Saw Stop, even fit in the Bosch up there. So you can get these lifts that will fit in any tape that's the only thing the manufacturers have agreed on is the size of the plate for the lifts. So if it's a modern table within the last five years, this will fit. Okay. Now, once you put these in, the plates or sometimes the tables will come with screws to adjust it. And what you want to do is you want to make it so that it's flush. You don't get that or you don't get a drop off at the end. So you would use the screws usually in the plate to adjust up and down, or you're going to get a router table like this. And I'm going to let you guys look at this. this is a soft stuff, a straight edge on it and it's raising and lowers so everything is nice and flush, but you want to avoid this. It needs to be nice and smooth all the way across. So here we have this side net perfect. This side's a little too high. So we would just adjust, adjust the screws. This one also comes with a feature I like. This is a mechanism. Once you take the time to get everything set and you're going to do a lot of stuff, you just bring this over and that cannot change. So you can go in and have dinner, come back the next day, keep on routing, and this will hold it in place for as long as you like. One full turn of this is a sixteenth of an inch which means a half a turn is 1 32nd of an inch, which means a quarter turn is 1 64th of an inch, which means an eighth of a turn is 1 28th of an inch. You see where I'm going? You can get a really fine adjustment on a router height, which is critical in some of the bits, especially the lock miter. And you can do this easily front of the thing, you're not on your knees, underneath, trying to spin stuff around to raise or lower. Everything is right in front of you. That's the one thing that has a huge advantage. This feature here is worth the price that you pay. And these things run about $360. It's well worth it. This is, I think, an integral piece of the, the router table. Because other than that, if you've just got a regular one, you're just reaching up and you're just moving stuff up and down trying to get the height that you want. If all you're doing is roundovers, that's all you need. But if you want to get a little bit more technical, you want to do doors, windows, things like that, super cabinets, humidors, you really need something like this. 
I believe it's got a, a roller thing here that you can gross adjust and it's got a, a fine one of these for fine adjust or vice versa, but I've been using adjustment for years and I really like them. And Jessam makes Craig. So if you get a Craig lift, even though it's blue, it's gonna have, it won't have this, but it's gonna have this and it's all Jessam parts. If you go um, with Woodpecker, if you get an Incra lift, you're looking at a Woodpecker lift. I wanna point something out that Jessam has that the others don't. When you measure in a router table, as far as the how how where you need that cut in your piece of wood, all the measurements in router tables for that. So if I wanted to make a grid, every four inches I wanted a, a half inch groove in my plywood. So I'm making a, a vacuum base. I'm going to stick a wood in vacuum bags, and I need a groove so the air can get out. It's hard to get that same that. And say I'm making a, a box and I want to put grooves in a box, say like a planter box, so water can drain through and I want those to be in a certain place. Technically, all measurements for that type of cut is from the very center of the router bit to whatever the fence is. So if I want uh, every four inches from the center of this to where the fence was, and the fence will be out here in space somewhere. Okay? These crosshairs exact center so if i want to measure anything all i've got to do is lay a straight edge over here and have another ruler up here to the fence and when i bring it up to where it says four right there boop, lock the fence down you're in the perfect class this is also worth its weight in gold because most people try to measure from the edge of the cutter no it's always measured from the very center the tippy top of the router bit and that's a stand that's standardization. If everybody does that, then all these things are gonna fit in the same way. Okay. Let's see. Other than that, just like anything else, this is gonna get a lot of debris on it. So you wanna keep it vacuuming off. But this is what you want. Now I got this great big hole right there. This great big hole takes these little red plates. And these little red plates, you can get them in pieces like this. And here it tells me I've got a blank, three quarter inch, 25 millimeters or one inch bushing guides. And this, and this is how big that opening is. Because I want the, one of these to be as close to the edge of the router bit as I can get. This blank one is so you can make your own zero clearance inserts. And how you do that is you lock this in place, put the bit that you want to use, as long as it doesn't have a uh, bearing on the top, and just raise it up while this thing is on there, and you'll have a perfect hole with the zero clearance. But these are critical because this is a huge gap. And if you've got here that's not supported, it can drop down below this cause a jam and then basically the wood's gonna explode. This is a lot of force, so these are great. So a Jessam one won't fit in a saw stop, a saw stop won't fit in a Bosch, a woodpecker won't fit in any of them. They're designed specifically for whatever the plate is. Not whatever everything else is, whatever this center plate is, that's what these have to be, okay? These are worth their weight in gold, though. You really want these. And you really want, they make a special one like this. See that little rim? Okay. This is designed for porter cable bushings. So you can have put a porter cable bushing here a certain size, and then you can actually do pattern stuff. Except instead of holding the router up here and looking at the wood, you've actually got two things like this on the wood and you're moving around the pattern. It's much, much safer to do pattern cutting with this and using the porter cable bushings. So we talked about these, we need these, we need them to be adjustable from the back so we can move them back and forth. We talked about this. Mine is a Jessam. I like Jessam because this is tubular steel. This is the strongest steel. Uh, some of the others use um, L's. That's fine. 
for what we're doing, that's just perfectly acceptable. These weigh a lot, and that's a good thing because you want these things anchored down. When you're using these up here, they'll move around a little bit. So I would highly encourage you, if you're going to use a bench top, you'll find that bench tops usually have little holes in the base so you can attach screws to lock them in place. Please do that because you don't want these things to move while that's going 22,000. Any debris is going all over your shop. If you think this little two and a half inch hose is going to pick up debris, cut here in big chunks and drop down there, mm -mm. it'll pick up the really fine stuff from up here, but it won't pick up the big chunks. That's all going on. And it, it'll grow really, really quick. This is an enclosed box. On the back side is a dust port that you're going to touch your vac to. This is here so that the vacuum will work. If I complete, you know, seal this on, then the vacuum would draw a vacuum and it'd stop working. So if you're gonna have this, you've always gotta have ways air can get in there and pick up the dust and take it out back to the vac. This, everything's going on the floor. If you've got a really nice, really strong shop vac up here, I mean, one of the big honking ones just sounds like it's a maniac. Still 90 to 95% of all your debris is going to hit the floor. Okay. And the bad part about that, it makes the floor slippery. So they make things um, that look like little bitty boxes. And they actually bolt to the underside of these. And these are kind of generic. So you're going to be drilling holes or doing whatever you're doing. And that's going to trap all this debris. And the same thing, you're gonna be able to use a regular vac to get the vast bulk of it out. It's really dependent on the table and the machine. And just know that if you put one of these boxes in here, you've gotta have a trap door on it because you've gotta be able to come over here and change the speed. If you're using a regular router bit like this, it's less than an inch in diameter. You can go full 22,000 RPM. You can't use a lock miter at that speed. The lock miter is uncontrollable. If you were to have this at full speed, remember I told you that the blade is gonna, uh, when it hits the woods, traveling about 30 miles an hour. This is traveling about 50 miles an hour. Could you control anything if you held in your hand and something hit it at 50 miles an hour? Well, that's what this is gonna do. That's why we have to turn the speed down. This one, if we're making a nice door, a, re and a raised panel door, we've got a bit this size. Now, this is traveling about 90 miles an hour. That's even more uncontrollable. So you've got to be able to really turn this speed down to use these big bits. To do that, the router motor is going to have a control, but we've got to be able to get to that control. One of these router tables can let you control speed from up here. It's always down there. Okay. That way, it's always a good idea to understand which bit you use last. And the easy way to tell is just the sound of it. If you turn it on and it's not screaming like a banshee, then you've probably got the speed down. But you can find out uh, basically for, you started an inch and then an inch and a half and two inches and, and every one of those, when you go up in those steps, you turn the speed of that motor down. This is a very, very popular type of raised panel door bit. Okay. Raised panel door bits are big, they're heavy, and there's two types. There's one type with this bottom part all by itself, and then there's this type up here with a separate cutter. What this is, when wood through here, you're going to get an exact one quarter inch of tongue. That's it, sticking out. Okay. So whatever, whatever happens, that tongue is always going to be a quarter inch. It's always going to be about in the middle and it's good. It gives you a raised panel, a recessed panel on the other. So it gives you a little uh, um, choices. Now, normally with a bit this big, you raise a little bit, make your first pass, raise a little bit more, make your next pass, raise it to the final height, make your last pass. Can't do that with this. So this type of bit is fence. You raise this to the exact height it needs to be, 
then you cover it completely with the fence. Then you move the fence back a little bit, make your first cut, move the fence back again, make your second cut. You never move your fence back further than the middle of that. So what you normally do is set the bit up, get your fence so it's directly over the center of this, and then put stop blocks, then push the fence forward. And that way you can move it back. When we get to the stop blocks, you can't take it back further than you can do it safely. So it's always best to set this up first, make sure everything is gonna work, then either lower it under the table and bring it up in stages. And that's easy. If I wanted to bring it up an eighth of an inch, two turns. So it makes it really easy to do as far as raising it and being accurate. And this is just as good. All we're gonna do is cut off a little, a little bit, a little bit, and once we're here, it can't go back any further. I know I'm done. I make my final pass with the raised panel. If you're gonna do raised panels, you're gonna use these. These are style and rails, okay? And what this is gonna do is going to give you this. We use these for doors. The doors of the well, actually ones for this are a little bit bigger than this. But it's gonna give us a groove that our panel's gonna fit into. We can get different types of uh, treatments here. Our tenon, tenon. Now we're gonna have to cut this. You can see that uh, mortise was made with a mortiser. Another thing, a set of bits you can get. That we can do in here. Stuff like this. We can do stuff like this. Now, what would you use this for? Bend around a curve, drop leaf. Table, drop leaf table. So, we're going to need something that's going to cut a quarter inch roof, make a quarter inch tenon, and cuts that exact shape right here. Again, this is really difficult to do with a handheld router. It's really easy to do with a router table. So this is just an example of the kind of cuts you can do. Um, very, very common types of router bits. Um, this is a straight cut, double flute straight cut. Okay, does a great job. Everything I'm passing out today showing you has got a, except for this one, a, a half inch shank. I like half inch shanks on router bits versus quarter inch. You've got more metal to grab onto. On these, whether it says a half inch, whether it says a quarter inch. And I like half inch, but these are the types. This is a, a beading bit. That's a beading bit that leaves a shadow line. The difference between that and a round over bit is the shadow line. So this will make little lines that make it just more pleasant to look at. This is a rabbiting bit. Rabbiting bit you can get for one particular size or you can get a, um, a, um, a case that's got a whole bunch of these little different round guides in the top. That'll go from like a sixteenth of an inch or eighth of an inch all the way to like a half inch. So just by putting the different bearing on there, you can set up your router to do a, a different rabbiting bit. And this is great for cabinets if you're doing the back to keep everything stable. And this is a bit that will scare the absolute snot out of you if you're not prepared for it. This is a flush trim bit. This is a flush trim bit with a straight cutter which means that whole knife is hitting that wood at one time. Um, a spiral bit like this one is a slicing bit. This is like your carving knife. It's going to start the cut and just slice down. So it's not, think of this as a clearer knife. 
this is going to just wham. You're just a lot of vibration, a lot of noise, a lot of stress on the wood, stress on this and stress on you. This is much, much simpler, much, much easier. Plus this cuts a nice, absolutely flat bottom. This one, uh, it's only used for trimming. It's got a bearing on the top, so it means you can't use this to puncture. Um, they make these with bearings on the top or bottom, so you can use these for flush trims. I like the spiral, especially for flush trim. And what I, why is that? Because wood is a unique product. Wood, I've got grain running all over the place. So I've gotten this grain here, and if I'm going around areas where the grain is coming this way, see how this grain's a little curved right here? It's not flat across, okay? If I come on this with a flush trim, and I've got no support for this, you're gonna hear a bang, and you're gonna be rocked backwards, and your piece is gonna splinter. So you have to be very, very careful of where the grain is in direction to a flush trim. We want, as this is coming this way, we want wood to be, be like this. So it's getting supported underneath. So it's making cuts. This wood right here is holding this piece of wood. Over here, it's just the opposite. As we come this way, there's nothing holding this here and that's gonna get your blowout. So it's just a question. I, I found out that the spiral bit, the spiral flush trim, it's not hitting this whole thing at one time and putting all that force on it. You want good carbide and you want fine grain carbide. Italy is doing great carbide. The United States has always had great carbide. China's actually got some good carbide lately. It's not bad, but you always want the finer grains. It's gonna hold it much better. It's gonna stay sharper longer. A lot of the economy bits are just high speed steel. They're not carbide. So you're going to like it because when you first try it, you go, oh my goodness, things cuts like butter. It's so sharp. Because high speed seal is softer, you can get it sharper. Unfortunately, it's only going to last about 20% as long as carbide. So if you're going to send them out to be sharpened, you've got to send them to a place that can sharpen router bits that takes off the same amount of material on each side so they remain balanced. If you just get in your shop and you do this really hard and not so hard on the other, you've introduced a little wobble to it. And over time, as you continue to sharpen it and it's not the same, that wobble is going to get worse and worse and worse. So you always want to send these back to a place that can do how they're supposed to be done. That being said, carbide is going to last a lot longer. It's not going to be as sharp technically, but you can tell the difference. It will cut your finger just as fast as, as a high-speed steel one. But these bits here are solid carbine. These bits here are steel with carbide welded on. And most of all these are the same. Here you can see steel with a carbide plate welded on. Uh, that's another reason to avoid the quarter inch shank ones. The half inch shank, a much more solid column of steel in the middle of the bit to keep that vibration down versus a little quarter inch piece that's gonna be really easy to vibrate. So um, I'm a big believer after using them both. I, I All my stuff now is half inch. So we learned about the tables, about a proper height. We are learned about materials here. A good fence has tracks that we can drop accessories from. When, and here we need uh, tracks for accessories. Biggest, the biggest accent we're going to use are the fingerboards or something like we did with those drop down thing with the wheels. Okay. As far as holding stuff in our hand, we really like this. This is great. Just something like that. Keep it in your shop. Now, if you had that big long piece, you wouldn't want to come out here and hold it here, you just come in here and just move it along. Suppose you've got a big square piece. Same thing. 
with our square piece. Suppose we want to put in a grid pattern in this because we're going to use it for, um, let's say, a jig for the table saw. So we can put things on there, we'll hold it either like 90 degrees to the blade or 45 degrees. If we put a grid system in this, we can move stuff around and we can get that. So in that particular case, we, we might have the fence almost in the far back, okay? But here we can grab this. Again, doesn't matter where we will hold it here. We always want to hold it in the middle, but push all the way through. But if we have a big, long piece, and we need to go to that, we could easily sometimes take this fence off the table. So if we take the fence off the table, how the heck are we going to put the grooves in there that we need to have put in there? And there's a couple things you can do. One of the things I'll do is I will take not this fence, but I'll take a nice straight edge and I'll clamp it down this way. And this is a round cutter. Now I can stand here and a fence here and I can just do of just the distance from here to here. I've got the distance from here way out to here. So there's all kinds of things that you can do. You can make your own router table for, for, for tips, uh, certain things. If you go to the factories who made the big doors and window frames, you'll find their router tables look like giant sheets of plywood with a router motor sticking out of the top. They made those specifically to support that whole big piece of wood as a cutter. This is probably the most tabletop you'll ever need, but you can always take this off, put something crossways this way, and use the whole length of the table for your long, long cuts of long pieces of wood. You can only make some cuts with a router table. You just cannot make some cuts with a handheld. And Lee Jigs, who's the big dovetail people, usually the big dovetail, you're holding a whole heavy router motor. And now they've made it so that you can use a router table to cut a jig. And what I mean by the problem with the other way, This is my motor, okay? The base of the router is right here, and the base of the router is about the size of this. However, if I'm cutting here, that means that where my hand is, is all the, the weight that the piece is supporting. All this is up to me. So you'll find out that it's hard to get this absolutely dead up unless you have specialized jigs to make the base bigger but you still have this problem that you're only supporting a fraction of the weight of this thing the table you don't have that it's all supported everything is supported what you have is the wood and then the table helps support the weight of the wood so this is much much easier you can't drop a table you can drop this and if this is spinning at 22,000 RPM and it hits your floor, hopefully it missed your foot. If it's a wooden floor, it'll probably dig in and bounce around and scare the heck out of you. If it's a concrete floor, the bit probably shattered and sends shrapnel everywhere. So they have their places. There's some cuts of this is absolutely essential, but this is really where you want to go. Any questions?